face I came to your door and fell on the floor of mercy Guilty I stood, guilty I was I couldn't hide my shame Just as I am, just as I am Welcome to day 20 of our pilgrimage. Today we find ourselves in one of my favorite places, which is the desert of Judea. We're right outside of Jerusalem in a place called the Wadi Kelt. And this is important for today because we're going or we're looking into a path that goes from Jerusalem to Jericho or Jericho to Jerusalem. And this Wadi or this valley is when there's water, in fact, there's always a little stream that goes through the bottom of the wadi. And perhaps below me, you can see some of the pathways, a footpath and a hermitage, which belongs to the Greek um, monastery of St. George, which is just up the wadi. It's absolutely beautiful if you have a chance to come and visit. And so today we have come to this place because we're going to be speaking about the city right here that you can see. If Jerusalem is right behind me, right behind me now, you can see this verdant city. In fact, they're planting thousands and thousands of new date palms everywhere. This city is the city of Jericho, and it is known as the city of the date palms. In fact, the name of the city means fragrant. When you walk by a date palm and it's filled with dates, it's actually a wonderful smell. We have that all over Magdala and in different places of the Holy Land right now. So welcome to day 20, and let's talk about the healing that happened right here on this road between Jericho and Jerusalem, right outside of the city gates of Jericho. Let's begin. So here we find ourselves on these rocks. I've placed myself just here sitting in the desert and there's really no noise at all unless people drive by on the road. That is the same road that I think they're talking about here in this gospel passage. Jesus has come from the north, he's gone through Jericho and he's on his way to Jerusalem. The context is he's given a lot of teachings. People have heard about him. He has um, spoken about his coming death and people are trying to understand what's going on, what he's talking about. And as he leaves Jericho, this is what happens. Right here, we're going to go to Mark chapter 10, verse 46. This is what it says. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, rise, for he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Master, let me receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go on your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him on the way. So if anybody would hear about this story, um, they would know where Jericho was. This, if you look at the history of Jericho, is one of the most ancient cities in the world. If you look at the history, it says it, was, it has been inhabited since 9000 BC. They found different um, evidence of people living here in this same place. And but when you hear about Jericho, it's not just, you know, this history, but you think of a different level, the symbolic level. If Jerusalem right in front of me is the heavenly city, Jericho is the city of the world or the city of sin. In fact, for the Old Testament, it was the city of the enemy. The first enemy city that they conquered when Joshua led the ancient people of Israel into the Holy Land over the Jordan River, which is right over here. 
they say right in the same area near the same spot if not the exact same spot where Jesus himself was baptized and that's located right in front of Jericho so if you want to turn we're not going to read it right now but if you would like to read what happened when they came into the Holy Land you can open to the book of Joshua and go to chapter 6 and it talks about what happens when they come into the Holy Land and it's actually important for our um our commentary even right now. So if you think about what was going on, the whole people of Israel will come, were coming in. They were carrying the Ark of the Covenant into the promised land. And they came first outside the city of Jericho, which again, they had to conquer this land if they were going to stay here. And they were convinced that this is exactly what our Lord wanted. And so the, our Lord gave very clear indications to, to Joshua. He said, you will walk around the city once, each day for seven days or for six days really so each day as a community all together they went and they walked around the walled city of Jericho it's one of the oldest places oldest cities with walls even first day second day third day fourth day and the Lord said to them make no noise say nothing don't shout just go and walk so it was probably pretty impressive. And the people inside Jericho who are Canaanites were probably like, okay, they haven't attacked. What's going on? Are they just looking at us? What's happening? On the seventh day, the Lord was very clear. Now remember how important seven was. It's, it's eternity. It's the perfect number. On the seventh day, the Lord said to Joshua, you will take the people and you will go around those walls, not just once, but seven times. So it's pointing right to the infinite, right to him. It's like God's going to be doing something. And then he said, when you go around the walls, the seventh time, the priests will blow the shofar. They'll blow the trumpet. And at that moment, the entire assembly, the whole group of people will cry out. And so everyone is crying out to a greater power. He said, you will not fight. You will not shout out until that happens. And if you read in Joshua, it says immediately when they cried out after the blowing of the shofar, the walls crumbled. The walls came crumbling down. It's one of those stories that we learn from the time that we're children. This shows the immediate intervention of the divine. And so the people of Israel were able to come in and they took over the whole area and really destroyed everything. And I just want to point out another interesting fact of this entire story in the Old Testament. And that is Rahab. She was a woman inside Jericho, and she signaled her house for salvation, being saved, with a red string, a red rope. I think it was on her door, her doorway or something. And so when the ancient Israelites came in and, and got rid of their enemies, she was saved with that red rope. Because before spies had come in, etc., etc., she, she gave them important information. And if you read the Song of Songs, if you read different commentaries about salvation history, that points directly to that red uh, saving stream that came forth from the wounds of Christ. That's why in the Healing and Hope um, pilgrimage logo, you can see that in the wounded hand of Christ, as he's reaching toward us and we are reaching toward him to be healed, it's red. Just like that red string on Rahab's house that saved her in the midst of this great, you know, battle that our Lord won. He did everything for the people of Israel. So that's Jericho. And that, of course, I mean, it's just evident, points to this entire process of healing and what we've been talking about for all of these days as we visit different sites. It's listening to what he wants, doing what he wants, and then letting him do the work. And he conquered an entire city this way. Just as I am, just as I am, Jesus, you welcome me, you took me in, I'll never be the same again. My Mark tells us what his name is, and then he tells us, underlining who he is, what the name of his father is. Bar means son of Timaeus and Mark says it Timaeus was his father so Bartimaeus he was a beggar beggars are you know in a small town or even in a large town in places where people pass by they become part of the whole 
you know, um, setting. People know who they are. Um, even when we did homeless missions in Atlanta, the homeless people organize themselves in different areas. They know each other. When we would spend um, New Year's Eve with people who were homeless in Argentina, we would speak with some of the homeless people. They know each other. They knew who each other were. They knew where they were. And we were able to go and be with those people and get to know them. So people knew who this beggar was, this blind beggar. They knew his dad. Mark is underlying the fact, underlining the fact that Bartimaeus was a real person. This was an historic fact. This healing happened right along this road that we're sitting next to, looking down into Jerusalem on our way, or, you know, with Jerusalem right over the hills. So not only, though, is this an historic fact, if you look at the teachings of um, John Paul II Healing Center, this is very clearly uh, an itinerary of what happens when one is healed. Father, or, excuse me, Bishop uh, Robert Barron, who's, I admire him immensely. Um, I listened to a commentary he did about this particular passage, and I'm going to use a lot of what he said, but he also underlines this fact that it's a, it is an analogy of the spiritual journey. And I would say that the spiritual journey is really one of healing because it's a, it's a journey of salvation. So here is Bartimaeus sitting outside of this city of the world, the city of sin. And when we think about him, again, he's a blind man. He's a beggar. He's a blind man. And really, it's easy to make the connection between blindness and sin. Sin makes us blind. Wounds bind us and blind us. And they they put us at the side of the road, sort of just, you know, they're lost in unable to do things for ourselves. So if Jericho stands for that, we can also say that it stands for the modern culture, this culture right now that is over and against the Lord. It was Jericho over and against the Lord's purposes in bringing the people into the promised land, but he was able to conquer that. But we find ourselves immersed in this culture. And when we're talking about healing, and I've said this before, but I think it's important to underline, we can't do anything for ourselves. We are like beggars. We are like the people of Israel coming in and saying, wow, you want to give us this promised land? Well, I can't. I can't do it. And Jericho or the world is telling us, well, self-help books are enough. Maybe if you need some help, get a therapist and then you'll be okay. Well, Dr. Bob has said time and again that certainly when he was in therapy, he would bring people to, you know, understand where they were wounded, different things they had to deal with, um, different strategies and different psychological things that can help us. But he said, I realized that until you bring the Lord in, true, profound and real healing doesn't happen because he's the one who's the savior. And so that's why it's so important to have places like... um, the uh, Divine Mercy University, which specializes in psychological uh, training. It trains counselors and therapists and doctoral students in psychology. And what they do is they approach the entire thing with a Christian worldview. In other words, it's God himself who is all-powerful. Of course, he can do this. He can break down these walls of Jericho, but he's all-loving And he is completely interested in each and every one of us. He wants to heal us. He wants to save us. This is his plan. We, just remember, we are his promised land. It's not these rocks. It's not this beautiful place where he lived. We are. He wants to come in and he wants to save us and establish us as his dwelling place. my imagination, uh, I can just think about the fact that he knew that Jesus had come through this area many times. And so he may have asked some of the apostles who, you know, when Jesus was off with other people, he may have asked them, maybe he asked Mary Magdalene herself, how can I encounter him? How can I be healed by him? Because it got around that Jesus could do anything and he would do it when he had this personal encounter with people. Maybe Mary Magdalene told him, put yourself right here. This is the path that he most likes. This is how women are. We recognize the places where, you know, the special places, the places that really touch people's hearts. And so she used that feminine genius to put this man in a place of healing. And so he had heard and 
when he, because when you're blind, you know, your, your audition is much better. So he heard that Jesus was coming through Jericho. He knew this was his opportunity. He put himself in the perfect place and he took on the identity of the ancient Israelites and he shouted right outside of Jericho. He raised his voice and he said, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me, have mercy on me. And he knew the story well of what had happened in Jericho. Maybe he knew with his faith that these walls would just come tumbling down that were keeping him from seeing, both external in his eyes and also perhaps what was going on in his heart. And just as this was going on, maybe the other people around, at least, you know, afterwards, Mark talking about this, or um, John, who's very profound when he was thinking about this, they're like, oh my gosh, this is the same thing that happened before. And so he's making this affirmation, taking on this this, um, understanding of the Old Testament and asking the Lord for mercy. When you beg, you recognize that you're helpless. When you beg, when you beg, you're opening so that others can come in and give you something. And you know that you um, accept more or less whatever they want to give you. Whatever you're, re- you're given, you receive and you receive joyfully. So his attitude to receive the healing of the Lord was exactly what we've talked about over these days. A one of openness and a one of, of ready to receive from him. In fact, one of the most um, striking things about this passage is we've taken these words of Bartimaeus and we say them every single time we participate in the Eucharistic celebration at the very beginning. The Greek uh, phrase is Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy. We repeat it, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. It's evoking that um, that thing that uh, Bartimaeus said, son of David, the one who's coming, the King, the Messiah, Christ have mercy. I cannot, I need to be saved, I am a captive. This is the beauty of Bartimaeus's attitude and the perfect response that he makes when, or the perfect um, proclamation that he makes as Jesus walks by. It's almost as if he's saying what uh, Pope Francis underlined that I mentioned before, I need to be mercied, I need to be mercied. So after Bartimaeus shouts out to Jesus, who's coming up, as it says in the gospel, with a great crowd of people, they actually silence him. Be silent. Be quiet. Who knows? They probably wanted to hear what Jesus was saying. They wanted to be the ones who were close. And so this is what happens to the world of today. Be silent. I mean, don't think that if you're going to call out to the Lord and and entrust your healing to him, all these little ticks and strange things that we do or when we explode or when we become angry about things and you're just like, what was that all about? You know, people are just like, whatever. When you, when you say, Lord, have mercy, Lord, help me, the world's going to be like, can you just get a hold of yourself? Do you need a self-help book or something? You need to take a chill pill, go take a nap. You must be tired. They say a number of things to women. Oh my gosh, is it just your time of month or something? They'll make fun of you. They'll say, be silent. How ridiculous is this that you're going to ask the Lord to help you? Even in those small things, which can destroy, honestly, relationships, uh, can put up barriers and lies and judgments to other people. It's like, oh my gosh, seriously? She needs something. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. The world around will say, be silent, but we have to do exactly what Bartimaeus did. He was persistent in his prayer. He was persistent in his prayer. He called out all the louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Ask and you will receive, ask again, knock and knock again and again. We talked about persistence in prayer before, perseverance in prayer. He'll stop, he wants to. And it just speaks about um, Bartimaeus' great desire, his preparation to receive from the Lord. So with all of this prayer, Jesus can't help but detain, be detained. He detains himself. I want you to think back uh, on the interview that we had with Daniel Cariola. In that painting of the encounter, he takes his hat, staff, and it's planted there. His foot, his left foot moving forward, um, is detained because his right foot stops because there is someone who 
who is reaching out to him. So on this path, our Lord stops. And he becomes, like Bishop Barron actually explains in his um, commentary on this particular passage, he becomes this solid anchor, the center point of reference that we can always go to. Remember that the anchor is also a symbol for hope. And this is a, a pilgrimage of healing and hope. Where does our hope lie? When we either have really big addictions and problems in our lives or we're just trying to overcome you know, these little explosions that we might have every now and then in our lives that, like I said, can really damage relationships. Him, go to the anchor, go to the one who plants himself and stops and says, here I am. So what is it that happens then? Jesus stopped and he tells, who knows which one of the apostles, he may have said to Mary Magdalene, call him, call him. Bartimaeus was called by the Lord. We spoke about being called before. In fact, we had an adoration in the chapel of the call in Magdala. We're all called by the Lord, but specifically he was focused on this individual. And we're called and we're, um, we're made one with him. Just again, like I said, in front of us, just that way is the Jordan River. And when Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened up and the Father said, this is my beloved Son, you are mine, you are mine, I've called you to me. It's almost as if he was saying that to Bartimaeus, you are mine, call him. I remember when I was in Atlanta working in, in the city, Again, like I said, we would do some homeless missions and things. And I heard a story of a man who was on the street because he became a drug addict. And he tried to get out of it. He did a number of things, but it didn't ever work. And he, when he actually was able to give his testimony, talked about this, the key moment when he was able to get out of that terrible addiction. And it was just before he was about ready to die. He said he was in this place with another drug addict friend and he had enough, I don't remember, I think it was heroin, to just, overdose and end it all because he just couldn't get out and he was just trapped and so they were there and he had his drugs and he looked at him and he said give me a good reason not to do this give me a good reason and his druggy friend said well has anybody ever told you something that really has inspired you and he said at that moment I remembered in grade school one of my teachers I think it was a sister I can't remember well the story said to me Jesus loves you Jesus loves you. And he says, I don't know why, but in that moment, it was enough for me to say no. And he didn't overdose. And then he got into a program and he became a follower of the Lord. And he's a testimony now. He's a testimony, just like Bartimaeus in a sense. You know, we know about him because of what happened. And it's the, the M of the H-I-M, um, an acronym that we used earlier, healing, identity, and mission. He was healed, his identity was made clear. You are mine, I've called you to me. And then he was able to mission to go out and give testimony to that. Now, the reason I bring this up as, you know, baptism is what we hear when, when the Lord says that you are mine is not only because the Jordan River is in front of us, but because uh, baptism is what brings us into the church. The, word, the root word of call is also the root of the word church, ecclesia. And so when Jesus is calling, he's actually saying, come, come, be part of this assembly, really in a certain sense, be part of these crowds that are following me as I'm taking this road to, to salvation. And so he's calling him to be part of the church and it's baptism itself that makes us part of the church. It's actually an assembly of those who are intimate with the Lord, those who are following him, that are close to him and the community who knows that it needs to be saved community that needs to be saved and to be healed. And so that's why we call out to him in the liturgy, help me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And then Jesus calls us into the church. I can't underline enough that we're called to be part of a body. Even if you look at this hermitage down here, where hermitage means that people go when they're called to that, the special grace of God, to be alone with him, completely intimate with him. Nobody else is around. That's a unique calling, but even as hermits, they belong to the community, which is right up this wadi. They're never completely alone. Even the great hermits in the church, um, think about Benedict, for example, he started as a hermit and then people came around him in his testimony. And then he started a whole monastic movement.
So we're called to be within the church. And this is the place, not only where we find healing, which comes from the Lord, but it's the place where we continue together along this pathway of healing. And we receive, you know, the vision comes back. And just like with the Good Samaritan, which, you know, the inn that we stopped in is just a little bit further up the road here toward Jerusalem. It's where that innkeeper takes care of us and continues to pour the sacraments into our wounds and bind us and move us forward and keep us along in health. There was a, a film I saw once, it's a documentary, and it's called The Search for the Everlasting Hills. And it's a story of three people, if I remember correctly, it was three people, two men and a woman, and they're all involved in um, homosexual relationships. What okay, comes there's... together, or what's common in each one of these stories is that it is within the church that they found um, the healing that they were looking for. In fact, what happened is each one of them found the Lord in the sacrament of confession. Not all of them were Catholic. Some of them had heard about what confession was or just wanted to speak with someone, but then they found the Lord and they found that, that moment, just like with the drug, drug addict, to say, I have a different vision, I have a new perspective, I have a new way of living, and that came through the church. He brings us into the church. He established the church, this community, to help us along. Now you might argue, oh my gosh, especially these days with uh, gender identity issues and all of this, it's like, oh, why weren't they just you know, left alone to be happy wherever they were in their relationships? It was they themselves who weren't um, fulfilled. It was they themselves, if you listen to this documentary, that said, you know, there was something in my life which was blind. I, was, I wasn't fulfilled. And they were looking for something more. It came from them because we're all called to thrive. And they recognize in their own lives, okay, I might even have somebody in my life who loves me. I have companionship. I have a great job, whatever, but I'm not thriving. I'm not who I should be. And the only place they found that, according to them and their testimony, is in the Lord, through the ministry of the church. So just like Bartimaeus, they were called, and Jesus restored them when they asked to be restored. They asked for sight. And this gospel actually says that Bartimaeus, when he's questioned by Jesus, he says, well, what is it that you want? Jesus not only stops, he not only calls him to him, but he asks us a question. And I'd like you to ask yourself that question. Put yourself, like I said, right here on the roadside as Bartimaeus. Picture Jesus in front of you. Hear him ask you this. What do you want? He's already called you. He stopped. You've got him right there. What is it that you really want right now? What is it that you really want? Go deep inside and look again at those desires, those deep desires of our hearts. You'll notice in the supplementary material, there's actually um, a list of different desires that we all have. And many times the wounds and the sins that we get into is because we're trying to fulfill those desires in an incorrect way, and that actually deforms us. And so take a look at those things and, and let Jesus ask you that question. And you can even ask Bartimaeus to intercede for you so that you answer properly, just like he did. So Bartimaeus, it says in the gospel, sprang up. He jumped up, just like many people who had been healed in the gospel do. He sprang up and started following Jesus. But before he did that, he actually, it says in the gospel, this detail, he threw off his cloak and sprang up. I have no and if you think about the ancient church and the rite of baptism that we've been talking about, people would come into the, uh, the church, well, into the baptismal area before going into the full church in clothes, uh, their normal clothes, and then they would actually strip down and be immersed into the waters of baptism. And when they would come forth from those waters, they would be dressed in a new garment, new clothes, that white baptismal garment. And when you receive this white garment, you are a full member of the church. In fact, in ancient times and also in medieval times, people who were newly baptized would wear that white clothing, that white garment around in society. They would be testimonies to what happened to them, that they became part of the church, that they left their own life behind. In fact, you might be in a moment where you're like, 
There is something I need to leave behind. There is an old life that I have that I want it to be old. I want to leave it behind. You can cast it off. Throw off your cloak like Bartimaeus and start following the Lord. You know, it's really difficult just to be drifting along in life without purpose, to be, you know, just the daily grind in, in office work or in, in a situation that's not so good and you're just like, okay, when is this gonna be over? This is many times why people get caught in addictions. It's because they're trying to escape in some way. Well, you can escape or you can cast off that cloak and let the Lord give you new life and new meaning and new purpose. In fact, in the gospel, when it says that Bartimaeus started on that road with him, it means he was starting on the road and following God, following Christ in this new purpose of life. Remember that much of our sickness comes from being closed off from God's transcendent power. The sickness of Jericho, they were closed off from the true God, the, the great Lord who brought the Israelite people into the promised land. And that is the power of God's, of God, his, his love and his transcendence. He is our father. And so this Bar Timaeus, the son of Timaeus, he took on a new name. Just like in baptism, we take on a name. This new name, Bar Jesus, Bar Lord. He was now the son of God. He was son of the father. He was son of Jesus walking along this road. His identity who he really is, was, was restored. And this is why, again, it's significant that I think Mark points out that he says, son of David. He's also now Bartimaeus. He's son of the son of David. Absolutely stunning. And if you would like to, I would suggest that you look into um, your supplementary materials. And there's a, a graph there that comes from the John Paul II Healing Center, which helps you also in your um, reflection and prayer so that you can identify where there are fruits from healing. You know, Bartimaeus, I can just picture him joyfully following the Lord. Well, the seven deadly wounds come along with seven signs of healing. I'm gonna read those really quickly. The wound of abandonment, the sign of healing is being connected and understood. Rejection, accepted and valued. Fear, safe and secure. Shame, pure and worthy. Powerlessness, empowered and liberated. Hopelessness, hopeful and encouraged. Confusion, clarity and enlightenment. When you're blind, there's hopelessness and there's confusion. You can see these fruits in Bartimaeus' own life. Our little team is going to make our way down to Jericho and eat a few medjool dates in your honor. And we will also keep you very much in prayer here in the Holy Land. And we hope to see you again tomorrow as we uh, continue our pilgrimage of healing and hope in this very important week. And God bless you.